Welcome. We are starting chapter eight. The topic is hypothesis testing. And I'm about to bring up a research article that involves something called a pheromone. If you've not heard that word before, a pheromone is a chemical substance that an animal releases into the air. So it diffuses and the idea is it, in this picture here, this moth can release this thing called a pheromone and it is released in the air and another moth is affected by that chemical. In this case, it's a little love chemical here. So just one moth telling another moth they're attracted to them and it um, has them, I don't know, form this little love bond between them. So that's a pheromone. And I'm not going to show you an example in research here with the moth, but we will take a look at an example as it relates to dogs, which may not be a surprise, um, but here we go. Hypothesis testing. Okay, so I'm going to now jump into an introduction using a research abstract. So before I do that, let's just talk about hypothesis testing in general here. So hypothesis testing is an inferential procedure that uses sample data to evaluate the credibility of a hypothesis about a population parameter. All right, so just like confidence intervals, this is an inferential procedure. So we use samples to draw conclusions about a population characteristic. And I'm not gonna be specific yet on any particular parameter. We're just going to talk kind of big picture general terms to give you a feel for the process. So we'll be a little bit loose here in our definitions, um, just trying to give you guys a feel for what we're doing. All right, so researchers, their ultimate goal is to determine the statistical significance of the findings from their study. So let's just jump in then to my example. It's a little old now, uh, 2010, but this is from the Canadian Veterinary Journal. And it's about the efficacy of what's called the dog appeasing pheromone. So there's our pheromone, dog appeasing, it's abbreviated DAP here. So this was a study about a certain pheromone and if it can help reduce separation related behavioral signs in hospitalized dogs. All right, so here's the deal with this pheromone. So when a mom dog has a litter of puppies and she's nursing her puppies, she emits this chemical, this pheromone to her puppies. And what it does is it sends them, helps them feel safe, they feel secure, they feel nurtured. The chemical helps the mom and the puppies develop a bond. And so it's a very calming source of experience for the puppies. So the idea is if mom dogs release this pheromone to their puppies when they're nursing, that perhaps if we manufactured it synthetically, we could use it to expose anxious dogs to this pheromone and it will help remind them of that beginning feeling of closeness and safeness they had when they were nursing with their moms. So that's the idea. So if a dog is all stressed out, could we expose them to a synthetic version of DAP and hopefully help them relax and chill out a bit? So that's the study. So in this abstract, they looked at some typical signs of separation related behaviors when dogs are hospitalized. So they took a group of dogs, 24 of them, and they exposed them to this pheromone called DAP. So this would be called the treatment group because they received some type of treatment. And they compared this to a group of dogs that received a placebo. So this would be called the control group, the ones that will compare the DAP group to, and that was a sample size of 19 dogs. All right, and what they saw in this study, we're gonna focus on just one behavior. They say that their DAP treated dogs, they showed marked decreases in pacing. So when dogs are nervous, they tend to pace their kennels or crates and 
they exposed the dogs to DAP and they noticed that these dogs decreased that behavior, therefore indicating that they were bringing the anxiety down by using exposure to DAP. So based on this number, so this number is called a p-value, we'll get into that in a bit, but based on this number, they conclude that their results do suggest that DAP could decrease the separation-induced anxiety behaviors and fear in their dogs that are in the hospital. All right, so let's jump into the steps in a hypothesis test, and then we'll revisit that information in the abstract a bit more. All right, so when we start, some hypothesis is made, and it's a hypothesis is just a statement about a population parameter. Again, we're just gonna say population characteristic right now. We'll get into finer details next, but let's just talk about somebody believes something about a population and researchers put forward two mutually exclusive hypotheses called the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis concerning the population. So I'm actually gonna start with, so here are my dog study, and there's gonna be two hypotheses. I'm actually gonna start with what's called the alternative hypothesis. It's also called the research hypothesis, and the notation for it is H subscript one. So let me do that part first. So symbol wise. So H for hypothesis, that just means statement. Subscript one is called our alternative hypothesis. All right, so their research hypothesis, what they were hoping to show in their research is that the pacing in dogs treated with DAP will be smaller than pacing in untreated dogs. So if DAP is a positive influence on decreasing anxiety, we would expect the dogs to pace less than their counterparts in the control group. All right, the other hypothesis then, it's called the null hypothesis and it's H subscript zero, H subscript zero. So this hypothesis is a statement of no change, no difference or equality. So all we see an equal here. So the null hypothesis is basically that DAP is not helpful, that the pacing in the DAP treated dogs will be equal to the pacing in the untreated dogs. And again, this means not just in this particular study, but we're trying to draw conclusions from the samples to all dogs of the world. Right. So null hypothesis, DAP will have no effect. The alternative hypothesis, DAP will actually help dogs decrease their anxiety and one behavior being pacing. All right, so when researchers start their study, they assume the null hypothesis is true. So before they start collecting their data, they're going to kind of go in pessimistic and say that DAP isn't going to have any difference. But then they're going to go get some data and they're going to hope to show that there's really good evidence here that DAP will help these stressed out dogs. All right, then they start their experiment, they collect their data, and then they evaluate the significance of their sample results. And if they see good evidence, strong evidence against the null hypothesis, we say they reject it. So we're searching for evidence against it because we'd like to say the alternative is the true reality. So researchers make their decision about this null hypothesis. We say we either reject it or fail to reject it, and then they write their conclusion. All right, so when we say in statistics that findings were statistically significant, it means that our sample results did lead us to reject that null hypothesis. So rejecting this hypothesis means we're supporting the alternative. All right, so 
the decreased pacing that this particular study saw, it had a p-value of, so back up top here, this thing is called the p-value, that's 0 0.017. So I'm going to put that in. Usually it's reported in decimal, but p does stand for probability value. So I, I like to write that as a percent. So 1.7%, so we can interpret that value. So what is a p-value? Right, so if in reality, DAP has no effect on dogs, so in other words, if the null hypothesis is true, that DAP does not influence the dogs, then this p-value is the chance that the difference they saw in their study in the pacing between their treatment group, the DAP dogs, and the tr control group, the p-value, the chances that what they saw was just a random chance event. In other words, maybe these DAP dogs in their study did decrease less, but it was just coincidence that it really didn't have anything to do with exposure to DAP. It just sort of happened as a random event on its own. But the chances of that happening are 1.7%. So the idea is that dogs paced less. There's a 1.7% chance. It was just a coincidence. But because the chances of it being coincidental are quite low, 1.7% chance is quite low, we would say that that leads me to believe it really wasn't chance. It really was a DAP that had um, the effect of decreasing the anxiety. All right, so that's the big picture view here. So when we look at research, we're looking for small p-values because small p-values will tell us there's good support for our alternative hypothesis. So uh, I'm using words very loosely here just to give you a picture. So 1.7% are the chances that the null is true based on what you saw in your study. So if that probability is low, we're going to say, we're going to reject this. I don't believe that anymore. I believe DAP helped. Now, as always, we're never going to be 100% sure of what's true for all dogs because we are looking at only a sample. But that is the nature of using samples. They're never perfect pictures of an entire population, so we can make mistakes. All right, so the summary here is the lower the p-value, the lower that number, the more reason we have to doubt the null hypothesis, and therefore the more reason we have to support the alternative. I'm just going to say here one last thing and slide over to the side here. So we just looked at one study. And this thing called DAP, by the way, you can go on Amazon and see all sorts of people that sell um, products that release this pheromone, like a pheromone collar or a diffuser um, that you can used to see if it could help your dog relax. And I only showed one study, but there are lots of studies that have been done on this topic. So we should never just trust one study on anything. We should always see if other people have found similar things in their own research. So this is just a little blurb here. I'm going to come to the end. It says in 2014, a, a critical review of studies on synthetic DAP in veterinary hospital wards showed there was little or no ro robust evidence that it could be effective. So our article just said it suggested that DAP did work in that veterinary hospitalization setting. But upon reviewing many studies, this particular blurb says that there really didn't show up um, to be any really solid evidence that it was helpful there. So again, you've got to look at lots of research to draw conclusions. But I will say um, that they say that it was found to be, DAP was found to be highly effective in fear behaviors relating to sound sensitivity and fear of noises. So there does seem to be 
um, some good evidence that it may help dogs when it comes to high anxiety times, like when fireworks are happening or thunderstorms happen. So if you had a dog that was sensitive to those things, it might be worth trying um, to expose them to this pheromone. So we never want to believe just one study. We'd like to know if other people have replicated it and found similar results.